Hello, everybody. You're watching this on a Friday, even though this is being filmed on a Wednesday. And uh, Cindy just told me, because I was telling them that this will go up on Friday morning, and she just told me that Friday is the goddess day, which uh, I was saying, I don't I don't uh, believe in coincidence. So, um, and this is an episode that we're going to be doing over the goddess Isis. But before we get into that, Cindy, how are you doing from Sacred Garden Yoga? I'm doing great. Thank you. I've I've just been working, teaching classes, working with people, being a mom, all the good old usual stuff. So everything's got good. <laughs> being a goddess. Being right. a goddess. <laughs> just being yeah. a goddess. That's all. <laughs> is what it is. And then, of course, we've got another goddess here, Stephanie, from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening with her palm tree behind her. Cindy asked Stephanie why she had a Christmas tree behind her. <laughs> so we had to tell her that. No, it's a palm tree. <laughs> it's a palm tree behind her. I love my palm tree lamp. <laughs> uh, my next Christmas tree. <laughs> probably the only palm tree up in the Northeast, correct? Actually, if you go to the beach... There's a couple of beaches that put, put real palm trees in the ground during the summertime and then remove them for the winter. I don't know how that works, but they do that. I don't know. Interesting. But, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Our, down in the South, our palm trees stay up all year. So <laughs> I have to say, have y'all seen that really funny Christmas meme? I think it's from Florida where they put lights up the palm tree. You know how on Christmas people decorate outside, they put lights on their trees. But it literally looks like, since we're talking about I Isis, we'll say it looks like uh, the Osiris statues, if you know what I'm talking about, that are like the, the phallic wieners. But the way that it was like, it was like lights up with the, the palms coming out. So it looks like a very happy Osiris phallic <laughs> wiener. So That's you'll hilarious. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Trying to keep it kind of PG. Hilarious. <laughs> it's hysterical. It's like be careful where you put your lights because it literally looks like something I've seen from Florida. So apparently every time I'm on Bryce's channel, she comes out with these things. So apparently I'm a bad influence. <laughs> well, I don't know. The palm tree. It's the palm tree. It's it's I will see you no know, I'll, I'll see if I can find that picture. And if I can find that picture, I will insert it into this episode so you guys know what we're talking about. So all right. Well, I want to also say too, and I think most of the people watching right now understand that basically as we go through this great awakening, it's reawakening stuff that I think we already kind of knew deep down inside. And we know that a lot of the information that we've been given regarding spirituality and faith and religion has been very much manipulated over the years. And I think one of the characters of the past that has been very much manipulated by the matrix system will say is the character of Isis, um, the goddess Isis, who of course was the consort to Osiris. And if you guys have been following along on my Magdalene series, which was inspired by Cindy, the book with Megan Watterson, we are going to be getting into the fact that Mary Magdalene, as well as Joshua were both raised in the priestess hood of Isis. I know that's going to ruffle some feathers, but we know that from research that we've seen now that neither Yahshua, Jesus, or Mary Magdalene were actually Jewish. Um, they were raised in this Egyptian inspired faith. And so hopefully my hope is that as we start to kind of untangle these, these webs that we will see that as have more of an openness to what they actually were raised under and see the good in it versus what we've been trained to be afraid of through religion, if that makes sense. So Cindy, you, you run courses on the goddesses and all that kind of stuff. And once again, guys, I'll put all those links down in the description box. Can you give us a brief um, overview of who Isis was or is as a goddess? Well, um, obviously she's a goddess that goes from way, 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 way back. And there's different opinions as to whether she was a myth you know, like a lot of, um, like, for instance, let's say Ganesha or Kali, they're more of a, a mythical beings. And, you know, some say Isis is a myth, like along the lines of that, but that still has like, you know, the energy of, of Isis. And then uh, some say that she actually really existed as a, an, a you know, who, who lived on this plane, and uh, she lived a life, and uh, she trained and that she was actually inspired by Hathor. This book right here, I brought it with me. And I, I know you said you have it, Bryce, but it's the Sophia Code. 
You have it too? Have yeah. you have you gone through it yet? I just started to read a little bit of it. Um, I haven't gotten very far into it yet, but I do have okay. it. Okay. Where there's a whole section in there about ha uh, Hathor and Isis as well. And I love her interpretation of it, of um, the, the energy of Isis. Because this is one of those things, when you start reading about characters like Isis and, you know, is she myth? Was she real? A lot of it you have to intuit and really sense and feel, okay, does this, does this resonate? You know, does this feel, does this feel good? Does this feel true to me? Um, but uh, so, you know, whether she was a myth or whether she was like a true master, like she actually existed and lived and was a true ascended master. I mean, that's, you know, up for grabs. But I mean, I do feel on some sense that she she existed and that she also, along with Horus and all that and with the Egyptian line. So she she's an Egyptian goddess carried a lot of the information from uh, the time of Atlantis. And uh, um, and I, th I think you've probably talked about that some too, Bryce, about, you know, the, the, the Atlantean history and how um, a lot of the cultures that came after, so Atlantis was wiped out. And again, there's different stories about that too. And um, how it could have also been, you know, the, the different ideas of what actually took down the city of Atlantis. And now, you know, the city of Atlantis is not so much of a myth anymore. I mean, they've actually done done studies now and, and some people have, you know, feel like they've actually found the city of Atlantis. And that um, you know, one of the possibilities of, of its takedown was the floods, you know, like the floods that came through too. And then there were the cultures that existed after the flood. The end, you know, the, I think it's the Andaluvian is what they call like the pre-flood uh, cultures that that existed or something. It's, it's called something like that. And the, you know, there's some people, uh, beings that survived that culture, uh, that survived, survived Atlantis, that survived Lemuria, for instance. And uh, one of the the survivors of that culture was the Egyptian culture. And there's a lot of, of the information that the Egyptians, the, their solar goddess, their solar, they, they worshiped the sun. Yeah. But anyways, a lot of that was transferred over to the Egyptian line. And Isis is said to hold some of that too, like some of the mysteries of the Atlantean period. And very much of being like a solar goddess as well. And we were talking beforehand where, uh, and, and some of the people that I've worked with probably have seen this, this big chunk of pyrite that I have that I work with, but I feel like it also pulls down some of the solar energy. And whenever I feel um, like the essence or the presence of Isis, very much the color red, very much the color gold, you know, I'm even wearing, you know, a gold necklace here to 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 symbolize some of that so uh working with the sun but not only working and holding the mysteries of that but just holding the mysteries of, of nature like isis was like an oracle of mother earth she knew how to communicate with mother earth and some of that uh you'll you'll read in this book like when you read through that section of isis uh some of that information is in there as well that she was like this oracle of mother earth but then knew all the magic she's the goddess of fertility of magic and of so many things and you're talking about you know how she was married to horus and then they had their child uh excuse me um osiris, osiris and they had their child osiris and they had their child who is horus and horus says it's kind of like gee there, there is a lot of similarities within the stories of isis and mother mary and then isis's child who is horus and you know jesus and they're the it's the new they represent the new aeon the enlightened like when when the divine feminine and the divine masculine come together they birth the child mm -hmm. right and, and jesus is a representation of that of that child, that union of the sacred. And so it was Horus, which was the um, the child of Isis and uh, Osiris. <laughs> yes. But um, no, go ahead. Well, she was said to be able to have the power of resurrection. And we know that there was a story with Osiris. And Stephanie, you know this story better, don't you, about what happened to yeah. Osiris? So um, 
I've been doing a lot of, Bryce knows this, so I've been doing a lot of diving into the whole um, Isis Osiris story, um, which I think was also very much manipulated in a lot of ways, because um, I do see those similarities with Mary Joseph and then Isis and Osiris and, and you know, a Horus and Jesus um, doing my research and everything. So I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Um, so I was like doing a lot of reading up and it, the, the myth goes that, or the story goes, um, that uh, was it um their the brother had um i gotta be careful how i say this k-i-l-l-e-d uh osiris and had scattered his body parts all over egypt where isis went and looked for the body parts but it couldn't find the uh palm tree Felix. The palm tree, exactly, the palm tree. <laughs> palm tree. <laughs> and which is where you get the um obelisk um apparently she had created uh this and to get pregnant with um horace this is this is just speculation just based off of intuitively i really think that the uh, manipulated church actually kind of um manipulated that story and if that were to happen i, I almost think it's like that was the seed of a christ because yeah. i think christ has come here many times um it, it, whatever that looks like so I feel like they were trying to take away something that creates that fertility, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you need the man and you need the woman in order to create the fertility. And I think that was their symbolism of we took that seed of Christ, you know, and, and made it their, their steeples in the church. I don't think Osiris was bad and they used it as a satanic sun worship. I think that Osiris and what he did was um, probably a lot better often what the Christian church has done all these years. And it was like, they stole it from him. And then they made it their symbol that ha ha, we got Osiris's Felix. Does if that makes any sense at all. That's just yeah. my interpretation and my intuition on that story. But I could be completely wrong. Well, I wanted to bring that up because if people aren't familiar with Isis and Osiris, you probably are familiar with the obelisk that we see all over the world. There's a big one in Washington, DC. And we know that the obelisk itself has definitely become part of the nefarious side of this but i agree with you i think there is something to that them kind of taking the seed of of christ consciousness and being like we have it now you humans can't have it anymore um well jokes on them it can come back you know and i agree with you I, it's funny i was saying uh, on david's show the other day um with the hindu faith it's it's mo it's actually monotheistic even though people think it's polytheistic it's actually monotheistic and i remember asking a, a person once like what's the biggest difference between christianity and hinduism and my hindu friend said all oh, christians think god came to earth one time hindus thinks god's come to earth many 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 times and i was like i kind of i kind of follow that line of thinking more <laughs> that sounds right many times not just once um so so yes and so I, I really want people to understand when we start to uncover these truths about these um either myths or people that existed in our in a human history what your perceived impression of them as being bad is probably not correct they were because remember the darkness can't create anything darkness doesn't it doesn't have the power to create it can only take what the light has created and invert it and I know a couple of years ago, there's um, an astro traveler or a remote viewer or something like that down in Australia that kept talking about in April, um, Isis and Osiris, the energies of Isis and Osiris had been taken captive by the bad guys, whether you think that's human or Draco, reptilian, whatever. And that once this was over, those they would be released again. And she kept saying April, and this was like a couple of years ago. So now I'm wondering, is it this April? Is it next April? Like, but I thought that was so interesting that she was saying that they had captured these energies and had held them mm -hmm. captive. Uh, and, that, and, and if that is true, that should give us a big indication of how significant Isis and Osiris are and were. And not only mm -hmm. that, but Isis in general, because she's always the one that's spoken about more. It, I, I feel like then then Osiris. So can we touch on that, the divine feminine and what that goddess energy actually means and what that means moving forward? Yeah, I mean, you see her um, in Egypt everywhere. You know, she has the different one is a symbol kind of like your, your necklace, Stephanie, where she's the winged one, right? And 
Yes. So she's the one out with the wings. And you see it on so many uh you know, ancient Egypt, Egyptian stuff. And then you also see her where she's wearing the headdress mm -hmm. with a disc. And that often gets confused with Hathor because Hathor also had the same kind of headdress. And then um, Isis uh, had it too. I think it was originally from Hathor, but over time, the Hathor and Isis mystery, they kind of uh, uh, merged um, you know, I think Hathor came first and Isis became more popular and then Isis started to take in some of the attributes that Hathor took it in as well. So, you know, they're both often shown that symbol with like the horns because Hathor is also known as the a cow, like the, the a, a cow goddess kind of energy. But, um, you know, yes, definitely de representing fertility and big time representing magic. I mean, she is the goddess of magic. Like how, how do we, how, what is the mystery? How do we make magic come alive in our lives? And as I said, she was like an oracle of, to Mother Earth. And she knew, like she understand the mysteries of Mother Earth and how to pull those forces up and use them as, as magic. Um, uh, in the last time we, we talked to Bryce, you had that book and it was Tantra or sex magic. Well, she's the goddess of fertility. Yeah. And so a lot of like sex magic is, um, this yes. One. Stephanie actually is the one that found this book and we're going to be reading yeah. it after we figure, after we finish, uh, Megan Watterson's book, which we're almost done. We're going to get into this book. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and so a lot of the healing, when you start to, to bring Isis into your life, that's one of the places that she starts to help you heal first is through the sexual energy and the, how it has been oppressed and has been deemed shameful, yes. especially as women, you know, it's like you, everything has to be closed and puckered up and you can't show that part. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you have yeah. to. Okay, yeah. everything in like this and that causes like this contractive feeling to your your sexual energy but the sexual energy is also the creative part of you your womb like for a woman it would be the womb space and men of course they have their own essence of like their you know their creative sexual energy as well but how it so much has been um demonized and mm -hmm. like sexual energy is not good and and of course, it can be used to that well, like, you know, um, but, I, you know, I also strongly believe that part of the, the repression of that has led to a lot of the violence that has come through sexuality as well. But to reclaim the, the sexual energy is also reclaiming that aspect of the sex magic when the sacred feminine and the sacred male unite, but I mean, like truly unite to awaken like this, the, the Kundalini Shakti, which then gives birth to the Horus, the child, the, 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 the divine Christ. And you can interpret that in different kinds of ways. I mean, you can take that literally as, you know, sex, but then you can also take that as the coming together in the union of your own sacred feminine, sacred masculine, coming together, finding that balance. We've talked about the Eda and the Pingala, right? Yep. The rising up with Kundalini Let's and then birthing the Christ light within you. So it yeah, can be yeah. metaphor or it could be like true, you know, true sexual. And let's um, hit on that for action. a minute because I think, you know, sometimes I forget, Cindy, and I think maybe a lot of people in our line of work outside of YouTube forget like how much we know from our studies of yoga versus people who have never heard of this stuff before. So for me, I, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about the divine feminine arising again to be equal, not greater than, but equal with the divine masculine. And I think a lot of people don't understand is that you actually, even though you as a woman are divine feminine and your counterpart divine masculine, the divine masculine and the divine feminine both carry each other's energies as well. And um, she was talking about the two nostrils, the two nostrils of energy, the left side of the body is the feminine side, the right side of the body is the masculine side. That's why women get their nose pierced in India on the left side, because it's feminine. And the kundalini at the base of the bowl, because it's, it's in, you know, I tell students a lot, I mean, Cindy hears me talk about this all the time, because repetition is how we learn. You know, a lot of postures, especially in Ashtanga yoga, we're pulling our foot into a half pod moss in our lotus position because the, the 
arch of the foot is going to push into that bowl of the pelvis. And that is pushing into the energetic place where Kundalini is resting and away and pushing it away. And once that Kundalini starts to awaken, it's going to then travel up. So the two nostrils representing masculine and feminine running through the body are also running around what we call Shashumna, which is in the spine. It's not a part of the spine. It's just in that area of, 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 of it's like a tunnel a portal of energy that will the kundalini will travel up through the spine to come to the base of consciousness which is when we get what we call enlightenment um and so yes the arising of christ consciousness and so mm -hmm. i'm so glad that you brought that up because i know a lot of christians are very much afraid of this kundalini but in my opinion it is the christ consciousness i just want to add to that too to anyone who i just you guys just know I came out of the church maybe six, seven months ago. I, I've read half of the manuscript already. I read a bunch of books at, at the same time, little by little here and there. So, but anyways, one of the biggest things that it talks about in that book is in, in this, in this might really ruffle feathers for Christians is Yahshua, Jesus Christ was actually activated by Mary Magdalene with the sex magic and the Kundalini rising. That's how he got his, I, I shouldn't say his powers, but he was enlightened. He was activated, his ka body, his light body. So, like, it talks about that. So, when <laughs> it might, again, it's going to be a, a little sense of a sensitive subject with Christians, but that's the truth of it. And it comes from that line of Isis. It talks about Mary Magdalene. She trained heavily in the arts of or the uh, sex magic of Isis. Um, and so, actually, uh, Mother Mary did, too. And it talks about that in that book. Um, Mother Mary is more into the resurrection aspect of it, according to the book. Um, then again, some of the book is channeled. Um, so I, I'm sure there might be some things in it that are not 100% accurate, but um, I just took what resonated with me. Um, and then Ma uh, Mary Magdalene was heavily into the whole sex magic, Kundalini rising. Part mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Well, and we've found too, and I think I told you, Cindy, that we have found in our research, and I will say there is an, an insider for the military that has sent me some files, so I can't show that yet because I don't want to get him in trouble, where it shows some of this stuff that validates some of the research we found. And it makes sense because Mary Magdalene was not Jewish. Neither, neither was Yahshua. They were not Jewish. Um, Mary Magdalene was not from a town called Magdala. That's completely wrong. The Magdalene her name Magdalene, which is so important, if Mary is not as important as Magdalene, represented something that had to do with the womb, the chalice of the womb. And if we think about the, the joining through the magic of, of, of sex magic of the womb, what do you, the chap womb being the chalice, what do you put into the womb? The seed. And it, Mary Magdalene herself, we know that her father was from the Ptolemy line. Of, of Egypt, which is Cleopatra's line. Uh, we believe his grandfather was Alexander Helios, which was Cleopatra's son. So that would make Cleopatra his great grandmother, I believe. Um, and Helios is interesting because Helios is the son, right? Helios' son, this is a lineage. And um, the Ptolemy line of, of Egypt, even though they ruled and governed Egypt, they were Greek. They were of Greek descent through Alexander the Great. Now her mother, who has been completely stripped out of all of the sacred texts. Her father is mentioned in the Bible. I won't say the name yet of who her father was, but he is mentioned in the Bible. Her mother, though, we found was Nordic. She came from the um, what the Cassiopeians called the Kentuckian line. And Nordic people also carry a particular magic. The Kentuckians carried a magic. And the Kentuckians were brought here, according to the Cassiopeians, right before the fall of Atlantis. These are what your blonde haired, blue eyed people. And so it's so fascinating when you actually study this stuff and like the real information versus like, the, excuse me for saying this, but the bullshit they fed us about these people, but the real story, it's so spectacular. So with Mary Magdalene, we know that Mary Magdalene's mother was also heavily as a Kentuckian, was heavily trained in the ISIS priestesshood as well, just like Mother Mary. And so here was this, if you look at Magdalene as this little girl, 
here she was born into this very powerful family. She's got a mother who's, who's a Kentuckian magic. She's got her father who's a Ptolemy. I mean, this is just ripe to create a very, very special woman, which the Magdalene was. And that, that is why she's called Mary Magdalene is because she carried that, that essence that comes from that priestesshood of Isis. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. And uh, you, were, you were speaking of the chalice. I don't have my chalice here with me, but I have like a, a chalice that I often bring with me when I'm doing certain initiations. And I'll even drink from from my chalice and it has roses and things on it. But the, the chalice is, is huge. It's, it's highly symbolic of uh, not just the womb, but also of embodiment mm -hmm. that we each, we, we are all a chalice. And coming back to the sexual energy and what it is to be human and that we are, um, you know, we're right now as the incarnated beings, our humanity is just as important is our divinity. In other words, our human body is a chalice mm -hmm. that holds the divinity. And that is part of like the, the, the chalice mysteries, you know, part of, of what that teaches is like full embodiment. And, uh, you know, what I strongly feel is some of the, the messages that are coming through right now through Isis and Magdalene and just through that goddess energy is that they don't want us to worship them. I mean, yes, I mean, you can have your statues of Isis and your, and your chalices and your symbols and all these things to help call down that energy for you, but they don't want you to worship. They want you to be. They want you to be the goddess. They want you to be the full embodiment of the light. It's like they're tired of the worshiping. It's like, I don't want to, they tell you, know, I don't want to be worshiped. I want you to, what you can do is you can learn and you can be like, be the goddess, be, be the chalice, be the, the symbol of everything that you're talking about, be the magic, awaken your magic, awaken your instinct, awaken your intuition, become an oracle of, of the earth, because, you know, we are, we are earthlings right now. <laughs> Right. In this body, we are earthlings. <laughs> Damn it. <no. laughs> I know. And we have within our blueprint, just within our physiological blueprint, everything that we need to connect with Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And that is where our magic right now, you know, comes from. And with that, there, there is so much power. And that is also part of the, the um, you know, the goddess messages mm -hmm. is um, where that might have been pushed down before, shoved down as look, looking at as bad, like you shouldn't, the pagans, you know, bad, bad, bad pagans, <laughs> bad, let's burn them, let's do that to all these terrible things to the pagans, because that's what a lot of where a lot of that, you know, came from, yeah. but it's about it's from empowerment, like you have, you have the power, you, you are the embodiment of it, and that didn't fit the narrative, at the time. So let's just, you know, squelch it and, Which is, and to turn the narrative into something else. It's interesting because literally that was the teachings of Yahshua too, as he's called Jesus in the Bible. If you go and read his stories, the little we're given in the Bible of his actual stories, he's literally telling you that. He's mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. telling you that you... What does he say? He says, you will do these things, but even greater than I. Uh, yes. He and says he that. Mm -hmm. He says that, and he uh, he literally is basically saying, you are your, even though we call him the savior, he basically is saying, you're your own savior. Like, wake up. He's just like, wake up, people like you. Yeah. You know, you don't need to be controlled by religious leaders. And I, Megan Watterson talks about that a lot, about this idea of when we really explore these teachings, what's happening is we're basically saying, oh, there's no spiritual authority on earth. And that's, that's terrifying to people who want to have that authority over people. Yeah. It's terrifying to the powers that be. If, if humans knew that there was no one person on this earth that had spiritual authority over them, if they knew that they literally, like the Gnostics, the Gnosis, that they literally were their own spiritual authority, they were, literally were their own sovereign being, and they could stand in that, then there would be no way to control the masses. 
in the Bible too. So I wanted to bring up something really interesting. I just found out as well. If you take the first book of the Bible and that's the book that talks about the flood and everything, which you were saying how the Egyptians are one of those civilizations that um, did survive the flood. Well, Je Genesis actually stands for genetics of ISIS. Mm, so I just found that out. I got so excited about it because it explains a whole lot, you know, and we know that the whole Bible is so darn manipulated, but I, I think it's originality was talking about probably Cindy, what you were talking about, how that civilization survived that flood. And so mm -hmm. then that's the story in going further on, which was completely manipulated to serve Lucifer not the God we think. Um, but yeah, I found that very fascinating. You see yeah, those little okay. clues, you see those clues in there that they, you know, didn't think we would pick up on. And, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, it, well, even there was even, uh, I have to be careful how I say this, but there was a group, we'll just call it a mean group from the middle East that do mean things. Cause we can't mm -hmm. say the two word that they named what mm -hmm. ISIS. ISIS. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when you go, when I go to Google, so I already pulled some images for the editing and I was Googling, um, when you go to Google ISIS, if you don't put in ISIS goddess, that's all you'll I get. Know. Yeah, that it's happened to me because I was researching and I, I realized I had to put in goddess or the priestess hood of or any of that. And um, I, I think that's really, really sick, by the way. And of course, it's Google. So, but I searched on DuckDuckGo and you don't necessarily have to put that in to DuckDuckGo, but um but that yeah well now duck that go is actually compromised i don't know if you saw that i know i, I heard that then. yeah so um but they're trying their damnedest to keep this stuff from from hitting the the mainstream knowledge but it's so and that's what i love so much about the magdalene series itself because as i've said people told the people that are following along we're just starting with mary magdalene we're going to be getting into isis and into sophia and it's interesting because I've read the Apocryphon of John on my channel a long time ago. There's many Apocryphon books that were removed. Actually, the Apocryphon books stayed in the Bible for a very long time. They were removed with King James, who was a total. I have a whole video on that if y'all want to see who King, King James really was. But he removed all the Apocryphon books. And the Apocryphons talk about Sophia. They talk about uh, God, source, being father, mother. The, the, the yes. duality of divine feminine. They talk about all this stuff. They're very open. The fact that when we talk about the Christ as a physical person, not just the consciousness, we're not just talking about Yahshua. He alone was not the Christ. He alone could not be the Christ. He needed the Magdalene. The Magdalene alone could not be the Christ. There had to be two of them. There had to be. That's the law. A divine feminine, a divine masculine. They work together. They work together to bring and about a, a teachings of Christ consciousness. And you can't know one without the other. That's the, especially in our human form. Like maybe if we were all in our just one consciousness, but we're in human form. And by being in human form, we are in the form of Shakti. In the, uh, uh, when I was doing some research myself on Sophia, and I was trying to see, it's like, okay, is there a difference between the Sophia and Shakti? And the Shakti would be a Hindu word in the tantric Hindu philosophy for the same thing of what Sophia stands for, which is the creative feminine energy. Yep. And uh, when you go into this, the Shiva Shakti teachings, one of the big things is you cannot know Shiva, which would be the, the male aspect, right? You cannot know Shiva without Shakti. You just can't. You can't know one without the other because the second that Shiva comes into any kind of form whatsoever in any kind of form that you'd be able to recognize it, whether it's, you know, you see it through your eyes or you have a thought or you have a feeling that that form, it has to come through Shakti. It can't come through anything else. So it's almost like you can't even say just, you have to say Shiva Shakti. Yeah, because yeah. you can't know one without the other. Which is something you said, Cindy, once about the, the, the Shakti being the expression of that, that consciousness. And what does the woman's body do? You said, said that it's a portal. The woman's body yeah. is portals through energy. It's the macro being expressed through the micro. That the woman's body is literally a portal. Yeah. yeah. 
It's my favorite thing. It's still one of my favorite things. <laughs> my power move. <laughs> all women across the world are like, wait a minute. Tell the men, is your body a portal? Because mine is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah. It's so just, true, though, because, like, the moment, you know, sperm hits an egg and you get that burst of energy right there and then it creates a beautiful baby. Yeah, that is a portal. You're absolutely right. I agree with that. I resonate with that wholeheartedly. And the soul is coming. I mean, I know people... I have had friends say before that they can always tell when uh, who see spirits that uh, when a woman is about to get pregnant because they'll see the spirit around the woman. They'll see, see that spirit around the woman like crazy. They just see it. It's like it's hanging out, like just kind of fiddling its thumb, waiting for like the perfect DNA to actually come into the body. So literally, women, when you get pregnant, you're getting possessed by no, just kidding. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's coming in through you. And um, the physical is manifesting and then the spiritual will come in. And that is because your body can, can do that. It's created yeah. to do that. And even in the astrology, because we were talking a little bit that too, Bryce, um, where the sun represents the spirit mm -hmm. and the lunar energy is matter. Mm -hmm. It's like spirit and matter. And it's all about that spirit and matter coming, coming together. And, you know, the moon is feminine. The sun is more masculine. But, um, yeah, I mean, you can't not in our form, not in here in these kind of conversations in this human form that we we're taking, you, you have to, I mean, it, it has to, it has to have the Shakti. You can't, we can't even be having this conversation without it. Without yeah. It. Yeah. It's the yeah. Purusha and the Prakriti. It's exactly. The, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually Patanjali from the Yoga Sutras, the writer of the Yoga Sutra was also an incarnate of Yahshua and Horus and all these Christ consciousness deities. And oftentimes, uh, Patanjali is, if you go to like a Patanjali temple in, H in uh, India, I was about to say in India, Hindu and in India coming in India, um, he's, uh, Patanjali is represented as the serpent. And a lot of like Christians will get all offended by that because they're thinking Satan, but no, it's the Kundalini. They're telling mm -hmm. you Patanjali is teaching you how to, through this yogic practice, to the merging the property and Purusha and understanding the two of them, that is how the Kundalini will start to eventually emerge. And that's his representation, which again is that Christ consciousness. Um, and so it all, it all, all these different cultures, what's so fascinating, they're all telling you the same thing. It's in everything, even, uh, you know, going back to some of the planet and the, and the hermetics, the hermetic teachings, uh, Hermes, and this is like a little Mercury that I have back here, a little, a little Hermes, a little Mercury statue. And the reason the, um, he's so important in like the, her the hermetic teaching is because Hermes is also, he's the, he's the in-between. So in other words, when spirit and matter come together, that's magic. That is like an incarnate of, of Hermes or Mercury. And uh, when you, you know, you start to get into the hermetic orders and all that stuff, that's why it's named after Hermes is because he is that essence of spirit and matter coming together and the magic of that, like where all the magic comes from that, that understanding, that pure understanding of everything has to come from spirit and matter. That, is that, that where we get the emerald tablets? Sorry. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, Hermes Trimistiscus. So I have a yeah. book on, on that too. Yeah. I just yeah, got a book on that myself too, to learn about yeah. the, the emerald tablets. And isn't the Ankh also have to do with the hermetic teachings as well? The, the well, the Ankh is, it is very Egyptian and yeah. yes, because the hermetic teachings, they, they, you know, they talk about Hermes and talk about Thoth mm -hmm. and yes. you know, Thoth is, um, is also sometimes Hoth, Thoth is considered Hermes. Thoth okay. and Hermes, like in some of the teachings, Hermes and Thoth are, uh, can, are considered the same, the same entity. Okay. And uh, the Ankh or the Ankh is, it's, it's the, it's the key, the key of life mm -hmm. that um, transports you between, you know, different, different realms and stuff. So, and that's big Egyptian and it's Isis. I mean, Isis and the Hathor, yeah. you all see them carrying, carrying the key of life around. And I think that the Christians. Had to, <laughs> what was that? I'm sorry. 
I'm not sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm just saying it's just really fascinating when you think about how it's all interconnected. Like you start yeah. talking about one thing and then you go into another culture and then you go into another culture and you're yeah. just like spiraling in the information. Well, this is where I think the Christians had manipulated this. Wow. And I, yeah, and I'll show it. So obviously it's a cross, but it has like a loop up here. And um, from what I did in my research, and you guys can correct me, is that uh, I guess, I don't know, the time of Constantine or whatever, but, you know, we know that uh, the story of Jesus Christ is Mithraism yeah. at this point. So it's actually not Jesus is Mithra. Um, and so that little loop at the top is the Christ consciousness come in, in the right in the part of the cross is the body. So it's yeah. that spirit connecting to the uh the um, body or the physical, right? But they what they did is they took off the loop and they just made it a regular cross. So you're not having consciousness or spirit connecting with the physical. Yeah. And we know now, and I think, I mean, I feel kind of more comfortable saying this now that the person who was Yahshua, the real Yahshua, wasn't ever crucified. That was a made up story. That was the Mithra story. He, he actually lived a very long life with Mary Magdalene. Um, that, and that's where we get the name Jesus from, which Jesus was not, the J sound didn't even exist back then. That was a made up name. And it does mimic Mithraism. And the reason why I believe they, they don't want, you know, any, any good psychopath, all right, any good psychopath cult leader is not going to want people to understand that they're you know, I was actually, I was driving today. And I was thinking about this. Like I was thinking about like the matrix and all this kind of stuff, like the, the negative matrix, not the just living life everyday matrix. Um, Cause we know we've talked about Saturn before and our friend Taylor, who's chan or had a friend channel, the planet Saturn and Saturn, I'm probably going to have to, well, I'll just say S Saturn felt like it had been R A P E D by this because it had been so inverted and used way more than what it was supposed to be used for. But anyway, I was thinking, I was driving, I was like, what? I don't even like care what other people are doing. Like, how do people want to control us when like really like live and let live? Like, I don't want to control anybody, but, but they obviously these, this, these group of people obviously did. That's why they invert things. They like, change things. That's why they make things bad that are actually good. Uh, it's all flipped. It's all inverted. And, and, and as I said, the, the real story, the real story of Yahshua and the Magdalene and Isis and Osiris and all of these beings that are really representing kind of the same concepts are so powerful and empowering. And we, we talk about, you know, the human form being the spirit and the matter, the Purusha and the property um, coming together and the magic, if that, it, it is so magical. So what does that say about each life? Mm. Is that each person oh, is yeah. magic? I mean, we, we we're, we're that, you know, we've talked about how like we're, we're a fractal because mm -hmm. so we, we contain that we contain both the energies and plus we have the capacity to even unite that with another energy. So, so we're just creating, we're, yeah, we're just a fractal of all that. We're, we're so that, you know, yes, I mean, we're yeah. so that's where our power comes from. And that's what, you know, some of the, with the, when you, when you talk about the, you know, the awakening of your personal power and when you do start to work with the energies of ISIS and some of the, the things that she'll start to teach you and reveal to you or, or that, or those sort of things. Um, and to help you heal where any of that has been ever taken away from you, whether it was from, you know, dogma or religious doctrine Anywhere where you've ever taken, especially if you were a healer or anything like that, anytime that you have um, uh, blamed yourself or persecuted yourself or silenced yourself as being a healer because it didn't fit the narrative, you know what I mean? It, it's like you were you were punished for all that. She she comes in and tries to help uh to, to help to, to heal that for you and to help to release that for you or if you've ever taken like this is a big one and we've talked a little bit about this before like if you've ever taken vows of poverty um because you know you take vows of poverty and that also that also kind of weakens you because you're you're an energy healer you're a spirit person you got to take all these vows of poverty and all this all this kind of stuff um 
and uh, heal any of that, the, the dogma, the, yeah. the religious dogma that's been, that we were indoctrinated with. She helps to, to come in that, yeah, heal some of the, the sexual, the sexual trauma that, or the ideas that we have about that. And just everything that has been, like you, like you said, like inverted or, or turned around or, um, you know. And let's hit on that again, because it's so funny. Actually, just today, we had dealt with someone that thought they should be able to like practice for free because it was yoga and spiritual. And it's like, well, if you practice for free, then I can't teach because I also live in the matrix and have bills to pay and have food to buy. And, you know, and, and so we've talked about that before. There's this huge like massive lie out there where spiritual healers, spiritual people should do services for free. But that's mm -hmm. an energy exchange. You know, if, 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 um, I'm, a, if, if Cindy's doing Reiki on you or healing you, she's giving up her energy to heal you, you know, and not to mention when you go through any type of training, at least in today's, in today's world, you're paying for that training. Going to India for me is not free. I don't get to fly to India for free because it's spiritual. No, you know, and so, and that is a, another thing that has to be healed with people who do work as light workers is this feeling like you're obligated to just totally martyr yourself. Exactly. That is a big thing that, that, um, yeah, that was carried over. And that, that, you know, I do believe that there was probably I was talking to a friend of mine about this yesterday in certain parts of the world. And I feel like I might've been part of this where if you were a healer, if you were a priestess or, or if you were a shaman in, in some cultures, when you were in a tribe, you were take, you were taken care of. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you didn't yeah. have to wear like, you were taken care of the tribe, your tribe yeah. took care of you and you were supported by your tribe and your people. Yeah. And now I do yeah. believe that there's an essence of that, that definitely existed. And then, yeah. and then that fits, you know, if you're being supported Energy, yeah. by your people, that fits. but that doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> no. Well, people say that about, like, and I know people have talked about that with like some of the older Indian teachers that some students like trained for free. And we're like, no, they didn't. They moved in with the guru. They did all of his washing. They cleaned his house. They did all, they were serve his servants. It wasn't free just because no money was being exchanged. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean there wasn't, a bartering system going on. It's never yeah. been free. And, um, and that is something that I, I, you know, because according to the law of one, and this, I know this is going to ruffle some Christians feathers, but uh, oh, well, let's just keep going. According to the law of one, martyrdom is a negative polarity. It's a negative trait to, to go on it. So being a martyr is not considered of the light. It's considered mm -hmm. of the dark. And so you have to understand that. Yeah, and I think ISIS comes in to 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 show you that, to teach you that. Now, I mean, there's the whole other side of that. Like, of course, you can take it to the point if you're not doing your own internal work where it can lead to things like corruption or yeah. it can lead to things like addiction or, um, you know, the ego, yeah. the ego being overinflated and then being run by the ego because money is such a powerful force that unless you kind of keep doing your work, it's going to always magnify where you are. So yeah. if you're an asshole, it's going to magnify your assholery. But if you're, <laughs> if you are, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you keep doing it, then, then you can use it to for good. You know, you yeah. can use it for good to support yourself and to continue to support your yourself in the work and helping other people. Yeah, and that's huge because I think a lot of people, especially when they're like new on the spiritual path, think that there's just a process you go through and that's it. But it's 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 your whole life. It's your whole life. You're con even if you're a teacher or a healer, you're even more so when you get to that point of healing or teaching. You even more so have to work on yourself even more to constantly keep yourself. You know, it's a constant practice. It's a constant tug of war. It's a con. It's never ending. You know, I shared a clip from the uh, documentary "Enlighten Up," which is one of the best documentaries out there about yoga. But they were interview interviewing Patabi Joyce before he passed away, and they and he was saying he was like one month, two month practice, ten years practice, no use, no use. Like don't even don't even start if that's all you're planning on doing. Whole life, whole life practice, whole life. Like this is not just some extracurricular thing you're going to do 
and then you're going to get to a certain level and like graduate. No, whole life. You're constantly having to recheck yourself and constantly having to rebalance yourself, you know, and especially it's like the airplane, you know, people thought you put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help someone else. Well, that's what teachers and healers are constantly having to do that to make sure that they are still grounded and in line in order to be able to then be of service to people. So, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you probably, and Stephanie, I'm sure you've had experience with this already, even like with the readings that you do. And I know Bryce, I think you've even talked about this before when you're, you're in the work of, of, of this, and uh, you're, you're channeling, you know, or you're bringing, you're channeling spirits and you're bringing in forces of light. They're going to work on you first. So you're, you have to do, you, you have to do your work, whether you want it to or not, because whatever is channeling through to help the other person on the other side, it's going to do the work on you first. So then I mean, I am always in process, always in process. And the reason I'm always in process is because I'm always like, you know, channeling. And so it's always coming in and and it's going to force me. It basically makes me. Yeah. Yeah. So you're constantly in process. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up too, because a lot of people, I think they go into these types of things thinking, oh, I did the work, I worked on myself. No, it, you're constantly like, I have to really rein myself in. Sometimes I have to do a lot of grounding. Um, I have to um, do a lot of things in order to put myself and keep myself in check or else, yeah, number one, the ego can definitely start getting in the way or two, um, you're going to, you can literally go into a mental breakdown if you don't learn how to spiritually take care of yourself. So I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people, they think spirituality is such an easy thing and it's not, it's not, it, it's going to be, it can, it's going to put you in a zone that is not your comfort zone. It's going to wreck you up to that. Yeah. And it's up to that person. Are you going to work through the discomfort or not? Mm-hmm. Well, that's, so. the, and that, I know I say that a lot, you know, I, I think there's been such a misunderstanding of this whole concept of light and love. Like people think they're just going to walk into like yoga studio or you know, what a uh, Reiki center. All of a sudden they're just going to feel abundant light and love. But th- to get to that point, you got to go through the darkness and that darkness mm-hmm. is real gross. And mm-hmm. it's, and I always say like in Patanjali's yoga sutras, he says nothing about being comfortable. Like it's, mm-hmm. it, it, he actually, the opposite, he basically points out our discomforts are where we figure ourselves and where we're forced to see things. Um, and it is, it is, um, it is, and it's hard to, to break down the ego death, to, to go through that dark night of the soul when everything that, you know, that, that illusion that you built for yourself, that we, we tell ourselves these stories, these illusions, and when they start to break down, whether they were good illusions or not, they're what we know. So when they start to break down and, and, and dissolve and we're left with something we're not familiar with, that can be really, really hard. That can be a very hard. And people, you never know how you're going to handle it. You know, cause it is, I don't even know how to explain it. Like before you enter that process there, it's just something people have to experience for themselves. You can't really explain it to somebody else, what that's going to feel like. Cause everybody has their own crosses to bear literally and their own stuff to go through, you know? And to bring that back around to uh, priestess, like priestess work, like the priestesses, the priestesses of Isis, the priestess of Magdalene, there's a reason they're called a priestess, just about everything that we were talking about. You have to train yourself to, to be a priestess, to hold the energy one that's always coming through. So if you're a priestess, you're in service, you're, you're in ministry, basically yeah. just, you know, you're, you're in ministry to the people that come and see you. And there's a reason that you have to train because you do, you have to prepare your own body to take all the different influences, all the different channels, all the different energies that come through you. Yes. Without having a mental breakdown, it's like you got to be able to do that while still staying sane and while keeping your body healthy, because it can also wreck your body and it can wreck your nervous system. Yep. Unless you have the, the practices like that's why I'm always exercising. I mean, I'm always exercising. 
I mean, I, I like to do it, but part of it is because, I mean, you you have to keep your body healthy. You get muscles are better for your central nervous system than like, fat. I mean, it needs insulation. If you do this kind of work and you're, you're always channeling stuff, your nerves need insulation. And yeah. so muscles, yeah. muscles, a little bit of fat and all that, you know. So, yeah, you have to train your body your mind so that you can you can hold the space for that and then um just then learn how to translate the information to where it's helpful for the person or if you're doing release work you're pulling you're helping people release or pulling things out of them you know you got to be able to follow all that so you know going back just to that idea of priestess that's it's a big deal i mean it's yeah. not like like it's not i mean you know you you train you train for that for many yeah. many 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 years so magdalene i mean she was you know a priestess of the highest or she trained for that you know oh, she trained oh to be there yeah. in ministry next to to jesus and 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 to you know help to to do that work but no it doesn't just come overnight no yeah yeah I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, we were, I was talking to Stephanie about this. If you look through a lot of the old religions and um, I don't even have spiritual practices, a lot of them, if not all of them, involve physical exercise. And it's, and I was telling Stephanie, I mean, we know from yoga, but um, Shanti and I did a body dysmorphia video a while ago. And I talked about how, you know, a lot of times up in the Western world, we see exercise, especially as women, as something to punish ourselves, to get into a certain size. But that's not the magic of physical exercise either. When you're able, especially like in the yoga practice or like dance or even bar where you're learning how to move your pelvis in a particular way, you're actually unlocking information, spiritual yeah. information. And if, if we understood that, and I, I really believe they've, they've morphed exercise so we wouldn't understand that. But if we do understand that, when I exercise now and I, for, two, for six, six days a week, two hours every morning, I'm on my yoga mat. I'm doing bar. I'm sweating. I'm doing something six days a week, unless it's a moon day. Friday's a moon day. So I'll be resting on Friday. We don't exercise on moon days, but it's it when I'm sweating, and I'm in that real intense motion, whether it's leg behind the head in asana, or it's a hard other class I'm doing. It's I'm not focused on the fact that I'm burning calories or anything like that. What I'm doing is I'm going inside my body and I'm feeling what sensations are coming up. What's interesting? What feels different today? Did something pull in even more? Was there more of a movement? Was there more of a reciprocal movement going through my spine as the muscles get toned, as the muscles start to pull the bones into a better alignment? Because when your body is toned, it's also moving the bones into a better alignment. It's also making sure the body is in its healthy position. And you're right, even just teaching Mysore, when I used to teach Mysore, you have to be fit to teach mice or else you're going to end up with like a broken arm. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. rough. It's, it, it can be. And so. Yeah. And you're moving prana. You're yeah, always yeah, moving. energy, yeah. And that's the thing you're learning how, you know, yeah, you're doing that and you're moving and you're freeing energy. Mm -hmm. And that's the energy that you have to use that you have to be able to channel. Cause everything has to come through your body, yeah. right? And yeah. so your body literally becomes the vessel of magic. Yep. So your body needs to be aligned and in tuned and your prana needs to be moving so that you can just like go right in there and do your thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but the, the importance, it, the importance of your body as the, your mind is the vessel, but your body is the vessel where everything has to go through. So if this is clogged, if your body's clogged up, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be good. And yeah. That's what priestess is new too. You know, that's part of that's part of that whole train. That's part of the idea of embodiment. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because that is that is something that moving forward, I really would hope will change is that people will look at physical exercise as something very different than what we've been fed. And that it does, there is a huge correlation between physical exercise and spiritual attunement. They are very much one in the same. Um, and it, and it, it is, when you look at all the paintings of, of these goddesses, they're never overweight. They're mm -hmm. always like got rocking bodies, you know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, you know, like I mean, they have some curves who always love that. They have, they do have some curves. They might have a little belly. They have an ass. Yeah. They have, you know, it's like, 
they're like, look at my curves. <laughs> That's the thing yoga does. Yoga gives you a great body, but it, does, it doesn't give you an ass. Your ass goes away in yoga. <laughs> it just basically looks like the tops of your legs. It's basically, you look at any yoga practitioner, male or female, and like they have no ass at all. It goes, it goes away. It just, just it vanishes. So <laughs> I think dancers kind of understand this. Um, and as some athletes do as well. They understand the spiritual um, connection between the mind, uh, body, and spirit working together mm -hmm. as one unit. And even, you know, um, even the like what we call it in Ayurveda would be like vata derangement, which is um, anxiety, overthinking. And I think uh, some of us, like myself, have more of a propensity to overthink than others. But when you are incorporating, Sydney, uh, I was saying, when you were incorporating a physical exercise, it does calm the mind down. It does start to work with the rhythms of thought to calm your focus down. So, and that, and that helps ground you because you think of like the Vata being the air, the cerebral, it's moving up. And sometimes I think, especially in spiritual work, we get so caught up in being up here and being in the fantastical that we forget that this is going to cause a lot of problems. If we stay up here, we got to come back down, yeah. put the ground back down into um that's one thing in uh, richard freeman's uh yoga ruins your life video where he talks about that when you have like a practice like yoga all of a sudden you don't require you don't really require the fantastical to get you there because the yoga is doing that it's bringing you into a place of being grounded in your body and feeling your body and and um i know uh something i've noticed as a yoga teacher all these years is that um so many people are not in their body. They're so, mm. they have no clue what they, they just literally are not in their body. And they don't even understand what that means until they get into the practice of yoga or get into a, a movement based practice where they're forced to actually come into their body. And, and that's an existential thing that happens with people who are more star seats mm -hmm. that they don't want. To, <laughs> I was talking to someone, yeah, a client yesterday. It's like, they they're cussing that they're even in body. They're like, shit, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be incarnated. This planet yeah. is too crazy. This body is too much. It's too much yeah. um, sensation, too much feeling. I can't handle this. And so then you go into the whoop, the up, like the escape, escape, escape well. mechanism modes or addiction or things that, that lift you out of, out of the embodiment. But yeah, that's why that's such, that's, such, such, such a huge goddess teaching, Isis teaching is embodiment. And uh, a part to that, uh, uh, just going along to what you're talking about, Bryce, is that your, your body is not a sinful thing. No. I mean, we are not born in sin. I, mean, yeah. I don't think so. I don't believe that we were, we were born in sin or that the, the body is made of like the flesh is sin. Yeah. You know, the flesh is actually quite supreme. And yeah. it is um, supremely intelligent, supremely, supremely intelligent. It's an Akashic record. Yeah. I mean, your body itself is an Akashic record that holds the, all the information of your soul within this lifetime and other lifetimes, not only that, but of your ancestors. It's yeah. like all right here in your body. Yeah. I mean, that's, how I, that's how I do my work. When and I do work with people, it's, I go, I just read the body. It's yeah, all in there. It's in it's uh, actually the original definition, the original definition, can't speak the original definition of sin meant to miss the mark. So just to not understand who you are. It didn't wow. mean that you were born bad. It didn't mean any of right. that. That was manipulated. Yeah, there's that manipulation that, that the attract wants yeah. you to think to control you. Yeah. Instead of you taking back your power and your sovereignty and learning your own power and learning who you are and learning what you can do. Yeah. It's sin just means to miss the mark, to forget who you are. So that's not scary. That's mm -hmm. not, you're not going to, that's not sending you to hell to burn. I don't even believe there is a hell to be honest with you guys, but, um, but you know, it's the state of mind more than anything. But, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I, I really hope, you know, when I look at like, you know, fundamentalists and people who are very dogmatic in this, you know, Christianity, which is actually Mithraism, um, what I see are people who are really in a lot of pain 
and they're projecting it out. And I'm really hoping that as time goes on and this becomes more and more and more of a common topic to talk about that people find liberation through this because the story of Isis of Mary Magdalene of the mother Mary of all these, these goddesses and these gods are coming back to um, a source creator. That's nothing but pure love, pure mm -hmm. loving conscious. And that's what your soul is anyway. So, um, so I'm hoping that these discussions will help in finding out who the real Yahshua was, who the real Mary Magdalene was not the person they've told us about, which was myth, right? Anyway, um, who these real, you know, the real Yahshua had more female disciples than male, but yet we only know of 12 men, mm -hmm. but in the missing gospels, he had like 70 women that he anointed to teach. It's pretty incredible. And, and it's because Mary Magdalene, he idolized her. And she, they worshipped each other. They in, in a very loving husband, wife, spousey kind of way worshipped each other. They, you know, it's what that's one thing that choked me up in Megan Watterson's book when she talks about understanding Yahshua through Mary Magdalene and why wouldn't we try to understand through Mary Yahshua through Mary Magdalene because she was the one who loved him the most. Mm -hmm. She was the one who loved him the most, and and he was the one that, she, and and he loved her the most, and so they mm -hmm. they 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 mirror each other in that. And so I'm really hoping that uh, as all this truth comes out, that some more people, to, men too, because this is freeing for men as well. This liberates people. And I think you're right. I think if we really understand all this stuff, you know, these sex crimes will probably go down because there won't be a repression. There won't be a taboo on it, you know? And um, yeah, actually it's funny. We were kind of trying to figure out <laughs> what marriage is going to look like in the new timeline like what does that look like in the galactics you know and we found out it was kind of like a binding ceremony but that binding ceremony is actually just sex that's, <laughs> that's what means you're married is that you just do it that's it <laughs> you know um i'm like well that kind of makes sense so no 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 white wedding dress none of that stuff it's just you just do it and then that's it <laughs> your souls are basically bound so um so that's either gonna make things less complicated or way more complicated so well i think it also brings to understand you know like the, the idea of sexual energy where how potent it truly is and yeah. the, the, there is something to like if you, if you have like a whole 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 lot of sexual partners that's that's going to influence you because you yeah. can't do that without some of that energy getting intertwined so there's a reason why i mean and and i'm not necessarily like in the the, the sutras they talk about celibacy and things like that and, and not that i think we should necessarily uh, uh, live a celibate life, especially as householders. Yeah. But there is something to the fact that your energy, I mean, your, your sexual energy is actually potent and it is actually quite very sacred. There's a yeah. sacredness to it. And if you just kind of, if you treat it with very, you know, just kind of doing this and that, and it's, it's gonna, it's gonna affect you. Let's put it that yeah. way, because it is so powerful. It's gonna have an effect on you. So how you take care of your, your sexual, your sexual energy, how you use it. It's a, it's a practice too. Like it make it makes a difference in your life. Yeah. It's funny whenever I teach brahmacharya to people nowadays, because in the yeah, yoga sutras, they taught brahmacharya would be like, be like celibacy, but it's changed. Um, because if you're not Brahmin, then you're a householder basically. And so I tell yeah. students, I'm like, basically just don't be a slut. Like, just don't, just don't, <laughs> don't be a slut. Like, you know, and you, you, know, you know, and I often think like um, karmically, you know, when you're sharing that you are sharing each other's karma, you are sharing each other's work basically. And even if you're going into a new relationship, I always think there needs to be a little bit of a cooling off period in order to let yourself kind of re rebalance within yourself before that new energy comes in. Um, cause it mm -hmm. can cause all, all sorts of issues cause it is so potent. And, um, and so absolutely, I think that that is, you know, that brahmacharya, just don't be a slut, just, you know, <laughs> just, you know, just be careful, especially for women, because there is something actually entering you, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so, um, it needs to be, it needs to be respected, um, and to have a partner that's yeah. going to respect you as well, because they understand that it's invasive, you know, so, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, but I think that's also, you know, probably I'm sure that was all part of the ISIS teaching though. I'm yeah. sure they, you know, they went into all that. Sure, and she was sitting there saying, now girls, boys, don't be sluts. <laughs> 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 so, exactly. <laughs> all right, ladies. Well, once again, guys, I'm going to be putting all of Stephanie and Cindy's links down in the description box below for both their channels. Um, if you are interested in starting a physical exercise, then obviously Cindy has on her channel, she does have some yoga practices up there that she is teaching on top of all these awesome conversations and discussions that she has on these really cool um, topics of spirituality, all the different, um, different avenues of spirituality that encompass our one physical body. And of course, Stephanie has her channel where she does speak about all these spiritual perspectives of this great awakening that is happening, which is shedding off the dogma, uh, that has been, uh, that has affected all of us really. I think every single person on this earth has been affected by some form of dogma. And, um, and so that's something, whether you were raised Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, I think there's some sort of a uh, familiarity there for all of us as we shed that off and move into uh, like a snake, moving its skin, moving to a newfound liberation. That's really just in the spirit. And I will also be putting up Stephanie's uh, email address for her group. So you guys know Stephanie does have support groups right now for people who are kind of uh, transitioning out of the church and need friends to help them. I'm going to put that up there as well. And I'll call it's for anybody at this point, Bryce. So anybody. it's been a huge help for those who um, you've been deemed crazy by your friends and family because you are on this side of the fence of uh, truth. Um, and you have exited out of the matrix and um, it, it's just a bunch of people coming together who are like-minded and are awakened and you will not feel crazy at all and you will be loved in these groups and it's a great place for people to just talk and it's a safe place and you know um, I, I, I just kind of sit in the groups and just make sure everybody's getting along but we haven't had any major problems um, as of right now hopefully that will continue but it's not just for church it's it's for anybody at this point in time cool and i'll put your link to your tarot card reading as well and Cindy, do you have any uh goddess workshops coming up or ascension workshops or anything coming up at sacred garden i'm i'm in the middle of an ascension um it'll probably yeah uh, it, maybe like in a couple of months or so two three months i might have another one coming up uh jen and i might uh we'll probably have another a planetary one coming where we'll be talking about moon the mars and the mercury and again just it, it, this is all just part of the the magic you know too yeah. i feel like what we're talking about with the isis and everything it's like they knew this this yeah. is what they taught that's a, this is what they taught their peeps on how to this is how you become priestess you know this is it you you learn about the stars you learn about the earth, you learn about how to pull it, you learn about the body, you learn about the power of your body, you learn about the, you know, the power of everything. And this is how, how you awaken, right? This is how you step into your sovereignty. So yeah, some of those courses will, will probably be, be coming up soon. And then, you know, of course, just the, if anyone needs help with uh, shadow entity, like spirit, any kind of energetic works. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here for that as well. I'm here. I'm here. I'm um, here. <laughs> I got my sage. I got, <laughs> we talked about last time. Uh, she had all her, her friends over there asking her to sage her. So she was like saging everyone. <laughs> so, um, so yes, guys, all those links will be down in the description box below. And let us know in the comments what your thoughts and your opinions are about this. And if your mind has been changed over the time about these characters that we were taught to that were bad, but now we're understanding they're not. Well, what was your, what was your awakening to that? I will also put links to uh, both the Mary Magdalene book, uh, the Magdalene reveal that we're reading on my channel, as well as the Sophia code that we talked about, as well as the Magdalene manuscript, which we'll be reading um, after we finish the Magdalene revealed book, which we're almost done with guys. So I'll put links to that in the description box as well. And Ladies, this has been lovely. Happy Friday. Happy Goddess Day to all of you. Um, we're, this was, we're coming off of a full moon. We're going into the spring equinox. This is a powerful weekend we have right now. So harness that energy. So as above, so below. All right, ladies, I'll talk to y'all soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.